from the University of Göttingen and uh, the GWDG. And the co-organizers of this birth of a Felser session are Jay Lofstedt and Jen Thomas Aquaviva. So what we want to quickly discuss and prime for our dis final discussions in the audience with you all together is that we want to really dive with you into the idea of workflows and we pull out some potential things that could be done. Some of them are, of course, already done. And all that I will explain to you is just a glimpse on what is possible due to the time constraints that we have as part of this Birds of a Fiverr session. And then in, in part two, we actually talk about a proposed community strategy that hopefully you um, will support us and we all together will build the road to our next generation for data-centric computation. Okay, let's talk about workflows and consider an example workflow from zero to inside, where we have certain inputs, we run simulation tasks, they may produce additional data products, and at some point you involve manual labor, for example, quality checking um, by the users, which takes a while, and at some point we generate our final product here, which then typically leads to some research papers or other insight. So this is an example. Of course, we have other type of workflows not involving simulation, um, EOD type of workloads and big data workloads. But this is, again, just an example. As part of one of these tasks, users may use HPC and big data tools, or they may perform some kind of manual analysis, which is a bit out of the scope. This whole workflow, so from zero to inside, may need months to complete. And we know manual tasks that are pretty much unpredictable. And the key question is often, what are the users really interested in? The problem we have in HPC is that this kind of workflows, they are typically hard-coded in scripts, Python, or what have you in the minds of people. The question that we now ask us is, can we technically exploit this workflow knowledge? And in order to do so, we should, of course, lift and abstract this kind of data and computation a bit further up. And then we could allow the system to optimize it. And lastly, we want, of course, as part of this exploitation, we want that user policies such as security or information lifecycle management is absolutely um, kind of covered as part of this workflow execution and automatized as much as it can. So, um, let me talk a little bit about how we plan HPC resources, something that most of you know. But me, I was always very interested in, and I envy physicists a little bit, because when you look at experiments planned at CERN, well, these guys, they really spend a long time and plan their activities ahead in terms of time and resource utilization. But if you look at the planning for data center resources, the compute proposals that you see are often just the time needed, CPU or GPU hours, the storage space. And once the proposal is granted by whatever committee that you may have in the data center, the scientists basically do whatever they want. Yeah, of course, there are some technical enforcements that enforce this kind of time limits, the storage space, and so on. But in a nutshell, we cannot, from a data center perspective, know anything, what kind of workflow they are executing, what kind of IO access patterns they are doing. The system doesn't know what is the next step that's going on, and the data center stuff, of course, they suffer because they do not know what the user ultimately wants. I would say personally that the execution that we are using with the script-based and of uses often tools that are 30-year-old concepts. And now when you think of about this low-level execution, even worse, there are a lot of things that the user has to do. They have to organize the file formats, they have to convert data, they must provide system-specific performance in, and they have to think about the system consistency models and so on. But users should really think about coding the application. And by application, in this sense, we are talking here about these little tasks. And they should really worry about the execution of this whole workflow in the data center and not just a little tiny bit that is relevant as part of a little task over here. So when you think about the future systems and actually current systems already, we have different storage and file systems, paradigms 
next to each other. What we want is that users can use all these compute storage technologies concurrently. So that means without migrating data manually, any manual intervention, the data should be put where it fit. It should be computed where it's sensible. You should, of course, be able to use stuff like the cloud hybrid uh, kind of modes to blur out into different data centers and so on. And it would be wonderful from my perspective, being part of an administrator with my head. Um, I would say it would be wonderful if we would be able as an administrator to add whatever new technology that may be a storage memory tier or some kind of new cloud technology and the users would immediately benefit without changing anything in their workflow. The system would just reschedule and dispatch it optimally. So in that sense, in this alternative universe that I look forward to have in 100 years maybe, um, scientists would deliver this abstract workflow orchestration, maybe containers with all the software. They would think about data management plans and the data lifecycle in advance and their time constraints and budget that they may bring with their research. Then the data center and vendors would take this description. They would be able to simulate the execution before the workflow is actually being executed. They can determine how to run this kind of workflow on their system, estimate costs, and so on. Systems, if they had this description, could utilize the information to orchestrate their code. They could, could you mute your mic, please, whoever that is? They could make the decisions about data location and placement. For example, you could trade compute versus storage and energy costs versus runtime and so on. There are many tradings that you could make. Lastly, the system should, of course, ensure proper execution. I would say personally that big data is ahead in such an agenda because what we talk about here is ease of use, usability, which is an HPC often, unfortunately, a last citizen that you think about. So let me describe you some workflows here from climate and weather to give you an, an example of how this could work. So at, in a large simulation, assume you need to simulate 1,000 years of climate. But you have, of course, to do some kind of manual data analysis, which is time consuming, because you may you are interested now in something new that is found in this data. So you would need all these 1,000 years for this kind of detailed analysis. So how is this workflow? Can this be executed? Well, you, you run this 1,000 year simulation into split it into jobs, maybe eight hour jobs that then simulate each year of this um, simulation in model time. You store the data on online storage. You keep checkpoints, of course, to run the next job. You may run back up some data in the archive. Once all this data is there, you explore a little bit of this data to identify how you like to analyze the data. Um, at some point, you would could then, for example, run the analysis on the full set of data. The problem that you have here is that you occupy the storage capacity of this whole 1,000 years simulation um, while you are doing this manual analysis. And this can be very costly, for which we did at some point the analysis at UKLZ. So it might be nice to optimize this workflow a bit. And actually, scientists do that. They use recomputation. So they run checkpoints, of course, again, but they store only selected data. For example, the most interesting diagnostics. And this can be in respect to resolution, the section, or time. Then they explore this data, and then they recompute the only the necessary data. For example, if you think about 1,000 years of simulation, maybe you are just interested in what's going on in the last year, in year 1,000. Could be possible. At some point, May, if you need this analysis for the 1,000 years, then you run the analysis across all the data needed. But then you have to run the simulations again using the checkpoints, creating the output that you actually need. So they are actually trading compute cycles versus storage. But it would be great if the system could consider the costs and automatize this process instead of having the users do this manually. So another alternative workflow, this is now if we had more intelligent storage and better workflows, would be that we store checkpoints on node local storage, of course, um, that we would try to store selected data on online storage, for example, 1% of the volume, also like a snapshot of the whole data in high resolution, only 1% of it can be stored. The high resolution data could be, for example, directly streamed on tape if you need to. Then you would explore the data on the snapshot interactively, find out what you are interested in, 
And then months later, once you are now really clear what kind of analysis you like to do, you schedule the analysis of the data, and then the data would be retrieved from tape, streamed through the system while it kind of performs the operation analysis that you like. And once this is done, you get an information like an email, you know, here is now your report, and it's kind of sorted. And as said, part of this workflow is, of course, done manually already. But what we really should be interested in as part of the ASC HPC conference is that we should have domain and platform independence, and we should support heterogeneous landscapes. And of course, we should think about utilization and usability for the user, make it easy. If you think about data organization, another scenario, you scientists are interested in what kind of experiments did I run yesterday? I did this experiment with parameter C, can you show me the results and so on? So our goal should be to have semantic namespaces, for example, similarly to MP3 libraries, where you can sort the data and you should not tamper with the organization of a hierarchical file system anymore. So that's another kind of workflow. Lastly, I want to talk quickly about smarter climate weather workflows in 2020. When you look at what, what happens at the moment is that you have instruments that stream data in. We will have, we have already Internet of Things devices that stream data into HPC sites that then run some kind of for, forecast and simulation steps in ensembles, so multiple simulations. And uh, those typically lead to product generation at the moment, which are then disseminated and potentially leading to web services. So what is now new in this figure is that, of course, we want to involve machine learning. So machine learning inference could trigger a lot of things. Um, from, so we could learn when is something interesting from the user. So we need direct feedback from the users. We need to involve visual analytics, interactive use, where the user selects parts of, of the data and says, this is interesting. And the system trains a model and finds more data that is like this or totally orthogonal to it. So there are a lot of things that need to be done in such a workflow to make it interactive. And as you can see here, um, like I said, machine learning plays a role and we will have more short term data repositories. We need to take care that we don't store too much data. That we, we limit the amount of data that we store and persist on the long run. Okay, now let's talk quickly about the potential approach in the community. So we found that MPI is a very successful model in the way that the MPI forum works and this all development. So what we would like to achieve is a standardization of a high level data model and interface. And of course, that leads into a workflow specification. And for what reason? Well, for data intensive and HPC workloads. What we should achieve is we should lift semantic access to a new and a high level that we can describe the workflows and then that we can then exploit them. We also believe that there should be some benefit for big data workflows and kind of desktop in the long run, because otherwise we can't sustain such development. Once you had such a standard, a little bit elaborated, you can develop a reference implementation similar to MPI CH, which is a reference implementation for, from MPI, and a smart runtime system that implements these key features. And then we need to demonstrate the benefits on socially relevant data intensive apps, and everything would be good. Of course, there is a, a caveat in this uh, kind of little approach. And that is that this requires to build a community. And that's actually why we are here, because um, we want to form some kind of community to move towards this higher level of abstraction. And nothing that I said here is kind of predetermined. We have all that are participating pretty open-minded. And uh, we really just want to make a step forward to move away from these low level specifications um, to a high level of abstraction that allows us and storage systems to exploit it. So here is in a nutshell how this kind of de development could work, right? You can have the standardization forum split into bodies such as the committee, work groups, and steering boards. Members are indus from industry data centers and scientists. The, the scientists have delivered um, some kind of use cases for which we build pseudocode, mini apps, and workflows that are used to demonstrate this reference implementation. And then, of course, from these use cases to derive the standard one. And we know with standard one will be kind of the least common denominator. So it won't be kind of this whole full version, the full featured um, uh, kind of idea that I presented to you. 
but we move towards this direction. And at some point we will have a standard, maybe standard two will be it, um, that is good enough and allows us to abstract to a higher level. Yeah, um, yeah, we, we talked about this, what could this next generation interfaces be? It should um, support smarter hardware and software components. Storage and compute, they are not thought separately, they are covered together. And there's a concept that I want to mention, which is called liquid computing, which means that you should be able to run workflow fragments on different types of devices, such as storage, compute, Internet of Things, networks, PCs, whatever you have. So instead of moving some compute to a specific location, the compute gets split into kind of pieces of the workflow that run all over the place where it is most suitable. Metadata and workflows are first class citizens here, and such a system could improve over time by being self-learning and by providing new hardware once you realize there is a certain limitation, maybe capacity or performance for certain aspects. You just provide a hardware and the workflows could take benefit from it. So why do we need this? Why do we believe we need this domain independent API? Because for this kind of approach, there are many solutions already existing that address a little piece of it. But they are very domain specific. You find things in, in physics, you find things um, that work for biology. The projects are very competitive, but we think we should work more together to achieve this common good. Similarly, as MPI uh, came together and brought together all the vendors. It's really a hard problem uh, that is approached by countless approaches. And yeah, we must harness ultimately the research, development, and engineering efforts across the domains. Otherwise, it won't be sufficient critical mass to move this forward. So to wrap up, um, we believe the separation of concerns in the existing storage stack is suboptimal. Users have to deal too much with low-level aspects. We believe there's a huge potential for thinking about next generation interfaces. And the question is, can the community work together to define visions and next generation APIs? So we have a Slack and a mailing list. Just visit the URL over here. And now my colleague Jay Lofstedt will kind of lead the discussion. And we hope you all participate actively in a discussion. And you can be very critical and open-minded Ultimate, just keep in mind, ultimately, our goal is really to make it easier for the users to run such complicated workflows and at the same time give us, from the system side, all the knowledge at hand that we can exploit this knowledge that is in the user's brain, I would say, or in the user's scripts. Good. So, Jay, to you. All right. Thanks, Julian. Uh, so where I wanted to start would be just a kind of an open question to everybody to say, um, how much of this is something that you'd like to see accomplished? And do you think this is something that in that maybe in your domain is something that's already been handled? Right in the chat, if you like. Yeah, yeah, I can see the chat as well. Yeah, so if you are not willing to share your face or your voice, that's fine. Just write it in the chat. So I'll just throw out a little bit of information here. So I know in my, my dealings with dealings different workflow systems, systems, workflow systems that there's a lot of um, domain specific examples out there and uh, like the climate one that Julian was just describing, they have their own workflow set up and um, the high energy physics people have their own high uh, workflow set up. And what we'd like to do is try to find a way to make a system that truly can work across any of these. And more importantly, make the workflows a first class citizen so that uh, the machine itself can better manage how to run everything rather than relying on the user to script it in their job script. So does anybody have any thoughts about this? Can you hear me? Yes. OK, uh, yeah. So uh, my name is Masha Sassonkina, and I'm from Old Dominion University. Uh, since um, it's uh, not a lab or um, 
in the industry, we don't have production codes, but we certainly have a lot of couplings between, as was described in this, um, both uh, between uh, uh, science such as running chemical chemistry applications uh, in Gaussian and games, and then trying to analyze them with um, uh, machine learning. And uh, so that's what I see a lot of proposals. After that, we have to run TensorFlow. And even when I'm teaching, my already my students combine these projects. So, and I'm what I'm, I know for sure is that uh, my HPC, um, support group here or uh, facilities, they mm, all need that. And what how they're planning to address it is by way of containers, I think, and using Jupyter notebooks. So do you think this could be incorporated into this workflow, some kind of interactive uh, thing, uh, prototyping in terms of no, uh, Jupyter notebooks, and then um, linked to the containers seamlessly? Because I'm... Um, beyond the students copying and pasting, of course, between the files or uh, the stuff we did there in the last decade uh, wouldn't work. Could you answer those questions? Thank you. Sure. sure. Yes. So, yes. so um, um, Lawrence Berkeley Lab is currently building a system to do exactly what you describe. And um, the only downside there is that Jupyter Notebooks, unfortunately, um, because they're uh, the execution order of the different cells is not necessarily well defined. Um, they can be helpful, but at the same time, they can also be quite problematic. So um, it does help, but it's definitely not a complete solution. I don't think that would be the Oh, okay, so okay. Oh, no, it's better. Okay, no, I cool. So the Jupyter notebooks, they are part of this interactive exploration, right? So you would, mm -hmm. you would use them and you would find out what you are interested in. And now you want, what you want is basically a button that says fire this up, this kind of workflow on thousand or a larger, you know, example of, of data, right? Or in, take this, what I have just built, this kind of workflow and integrate it into another existing workflow on this step of the analysis and do it automatically, right? Um, instead of translating the, the workflow into something else and then integrating in HPC in a bigger workflow. I, I, you're right, I mean, that's part of, of the story. And I think, yeah, it could be part and it should be part because it makes the user more productive. And as Julie, yes, Julie, Julia Mullin just, just complained here, complained here. Complained here. Yes, high productivity, productivity is an interesting approach. Interesting approach. Uh, I would agree, agree that uh, you know, high productivity is something that we should maybe bring back on the table and think about instead of just thinking about the machines and their efficiency, but well, doing it at the same time. I go back to the chat. All right, thanks. So the one question that we had come up in the chat or one comment come in the chat about the bioinformatics workflows is that there's a lot of them. And that's actually exactly one of the big motiva motivations for this work is that um, all of the different domains and really the, just the different research groups really keep creating their own. And the problem is, is none of them end up generalizing pretty much at all. And we'd like to try to work at the generalization part of it uh, from the beginning rather than uh, as something of we created a system that works great for us, now you try to use it and then it just doesn't work at all. And the bigger part is, is say, let's take the machine's infrastructure as a key component of this generalization. That way when um, we do specify something, we have a way to say, okay, uh, and the machine can decide where's the best place to run these different components. How long should this data be stored and what kind of storage media, uh, just based off of performance requirements and um, cost and capacity kinds of uh, decisions. And that way the workflow itself can uh, be better managed to give better throughput on the machine entirely. Yeah, so um, Julia also has uh, pointed out that uh, they've also been having problems with reproducibility from the Jupyter Notebooks. 
yeah, I have a student right now who's looking at um, uh, reproducibility issues for me. And the example that she presented to uh, the research group was basically how bad the thousands of Jupyter notebooks that are out there already are. Um, it's currently, in terms of uh, straight reproducibility, about 15% of them um, could be reproduced. The rest of them required either manual fiddling um, or just couldn't be re reproduced at all. So um, it's a start, but it's definitely not a solution. Oh, and she also is commenting about the, uh, if your notebook runs for too long and your browser overflows and you can lose your work. Yeah, that's definitely an issue. So some of the other issues that I know with Jupyter Notebooks that um, we've seen are things like, if they rely on external data, then um, unless that data is somehow incorporated into the system that you're saving, you're not gonna be able to get access to that. You also have issues of um, random number generators, for example if the or date and time kinds of things and those those all of those things end up causing the jupyter notebooks to be um an interesting start but um they're just not complete yet as far as making a reproducible reusable system like we'd like to see can you guys hear yes thank yeah. you yes okay i missed a browser pop-up window um so I bring this up because we've been working on high productivity computing forever. We've been doing interactive supercomputing at Lincoln Laboratory. And mm -hmm. I raise that issue of the tension between the two because people always look down on us like, you're not a real supercomputer. Um, but now as we move to other domains, in particular the data science domains, we have set up a way of sort of teaching these Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks are a fabulous tool when you need to teach people even some basic Linux skills, right? So we bring up the Jupyter Notebook and we immediately go to a terminal and we start getting people used to using Linux commands at the very beginning. Then if you build, your, if you build everything within your notebook, there's a way to export that as a script. And so we let people explore and sort of develop your code or at least develop your workflow and know that you're getting the right answers from that workflow. And then we basically say to people, if your code runs in the Jupyter, if your Jupyter notebook runs for long enough that you can go and make a cup of coffee or go to the coffee shop and get a cup of coffee back in the old days and then come back, you should be doing this in production. And we explain to them. So it's the easy way of bringing them up to start talking about what high performance is and start talking about production and performance and the benefits that you can get. And it's a nice sort of stepwise approach to bringing people up to um, something where later they may be able to use distributed TensorFlow, distributed PyTorch. Um, but but there isn't a smooth process. For us, it's still very manual. There are still little pieces in between, and we're often helping people get that set up. So I'll just throw that out there. But we do have we do have training. That's part of our training. Great. Thanks for the experience. So um, uh, how far along in this process do you think that you really are in terms of really making this uh, work? Because it sounds like you've, you're maybe halfway there to where you'd like to be. To whom did Issues. you ask? Okay. What? Oh yeah, who did you ask that? To me? To Julia or someone yes. else? Yes, to Julia, yes. To Julia. So Julia, how far along do you think you, you are in this process? Oh, we can't hear you again. Can you hear me now? There we go. Okay, it said allow and it keeps popping that back up. Um, I would say that most people now, they may start, but we are really bringing them forward. And, but we've concentrated that training, I would say in the last six months, that okay. real idea of, you know, develop here. And we've created the training to show them how to move it forward. So that's the key piece. And I think most people are open to that. And the good training means, you have to have the example for them. If you give them an example of how to do it, you'd be amazed. And you give it, say you give it a name, you like 
Jupiter mm. notebook transformation. You'd be amazed how many Jupiter notebook transformation dash my initials you're going to see. Like literally mm. people will be like, I can use that and go. And that's the key piece, finding the right application or the right format for the different workflows. And they will just, they'll use it if you can provide it. All right, great. Thank you. Um, so we have four minutes left. So let me switch to Adrian Jackson here. Um, let me just read what he has here. My question for the middleware would be around the granularity that is planned. Are individual applications the lowest level of workflow with files or objects, the data dependencies between applications? Or are you considering splitting the individual applications into major steps or functions? And Julian's responding, uh, once we have known workflows and parts of the workflows uh, can be interactive, we'll optimize what's known for. So we're kind of thinking about um, um, splitting things at really logical levels, probably more at the application level, at least to start. So, Kathy, your comment regarding Maestro, yes. So, we had started this discussion several years ago um, when there was not Maestro, and there are parts of Maestro that fulfill what we are talking about, but Maestro is not doing this full vision that, that we kind of introduced here as part of this discussion, right? So there are good parts about the metadata, for example, in Maestro. And yes, as we discussed, right, there is always, there is a zoo of potential solutions. However, the problem is that once the project is gone, there is another project at some point that tries to approach it differently. And there is no community forum, no long living effort supported by the community where people say, we follow this and we do this together. And we try to build things and maintain it in the long term. And that's kind of what we think we need instead of having just projects. Because with projects, you can fuel such an effort, yeah, and you can take good things from projects, but you cannot sustain long term. All right, so I just added to the notes here at the top that you see on the screen. Um, we have the website, which is where the slides will be posted afterwards. And um, that's a place to see all the events and things around this discussion or and other events that are going on in the space, as well as we have a channel within the, the VI4IO Slack. So um, that's another place we can join and have discussion there as well. So we don't have to end here. Instead, we can um, continue on and have this be a, a long-term discussion and we invite everybody to participate. mention here um, we in the poll that we made so 71% said um, you would be interested if the vision vision would have been realized or slash implemented right and 29% argued that they may need further information I understand that further information is always good we would not quite know exactly how the system looks like technically and so forth um, because um, yeah, this is something that the community must kind of build and create. Yeah, that's what, what we believe instead of the projects. And just saying, I think it's because it's the last minute, isn't it? So thank yes. you all for being here. And we hope we have further discussions in the future. Please reach out to me, Jay, um, Jen Thomas, or just reach out on the VI4IO communication. Yep. It's great having you here. Thank you all for coming and we're looking forward to seeing you later.